I'm going to start with a very brief introduction about the nature of accompaniment and how it affects our work. Jesuit Refugee Service is an international Catholic organization uh, working in over 50 countries with the mission to accompany, serve, and advocate for the rights of refugees and forcibly displaced persons. Over the past 35 years, we've come to make service to urban refugees a key part of our mission. Accompaniment is the fundamental principle that JRS uses as its approach to all refugee programming. On one level, it is simply being with refugees, being physically present, being personally engaged on an individual level, and listening to their stories, helping them not only to meet their immediate needs, but supporting them in setting goals for the future and finding the resources and opportunities they need to accomplish them. In an urban environment, accompaniment is usually aimed toward helping refugees overcome isolation, whether caused by trauma, poverty, or cultural barriers, and to achieve some degree of integration into the host community. This requires listening to concerns, not only of refugees, but of local residents as well, understanding the impact that refugees may have on their lives, encouraging them to extend a helping hand, and finding common solutions to problems in order to lay the foundations for a more inclusive community. Often helping refugees to gain access to community services while developing their capacity to attain self-sufficiency self -sufficiency, and to contribute to the local economy is beneficial to all. Accompaniment then has both an ethical component in that it means acknowledging and affirming human dignity and also a pragmatic aspect in that it encourages people to recognize and employ their existing talents and to develop their potential so as not to remain dependent on others. Because it is based on individual relationships, it also helps to ensure that the support we offer is the support that people actually want and need. So I'm now going to introduce our speakers who will discuss how accompaniment shapes our urban programming. And our first speaker will be Beatrice Giconio, speaking from Nairobi. And just one minute while I turn this over to Beatrice. Thank you, Missy. Um, I'm going to talk about our work in Eastern Africa, where we cover five countries. Uh, namely Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan. And um, in, this, uh, in, in my presentation, I will only cover Kenya and Ethiopia. And what we do in Kenya is we give emergency assistance to new arrivals and new cases. In this case, we have both food and non-food items. We also have uh, education, we have support schools, we give scholarships to students, we do teacher training, and we give comfort kits for girls. We also do psychosocial support, which means we provide counseling, and we also do information and referrals. In Kenya, we operate through five stability stations within the city of Nairobi. This was selected due to the large number of refugees living in the neighborhood. And refugees of all faiths are served equally through these parishes. In fact, in one parish, we have a particularly high number of Muslims as compared to Christians. For example, in the month of September, about 27 Christian some families were served compared to 68 Muslim families served in the same month. Um, why did we select parishes? Um, this is because being community structures, they help to be, to be bridges between refugees and local residents. And ordinarily, parishes give help to the local poor. So this ensures that our assistance to refugees is not seen as, you know, catering um, just one group of people. Um, 
in these parishes, JRF are support the refugee workers. We call them helpers, and they are normally appointed by their community. The helpers work two days a week, and together with JRF staff, regularly visit the sick at home. Uh, they visit new arrivals. They go to see needy and vulnerable cases. Uh, yeah, at home and in hospital as an expression of hospitality to the, to these refugees. The visits are meant to welcome the new arrival and to show solidarity and compassion with each individual facing difficulties. Um, the visit before the program supports refugees with both food and non-food items, rent and clothes for a period of four months. In addition, the sick and elderly and new babies are provided with food supplements uh, as well as psychosocial support. And during the home visit, staff are able to assess the level of need or vulnerability as well as the living conditions of each family to avoid using one size fits all status in providing help. Uh, JRS Kenya also works with partner agencies to ensure refugees receive services that we do not offer. For example, for medical services, we refer refugees to five medical centers. They, we also provide refugees with information on how to register with UNHCR and the government Department of Refugee Affairs. In Ethiopia, we run a refugee community center which offers a public library, a daycare center, a cyber cafe, computer training, and English classes. The center is a unique one. It is the only one of it in the country. Refugee representatives, again elected by their communities, are involved in decision making in all matters concerning the center. Here, yeah, refugees come to meet and talk to each other. Even they do their own group meetings, and they also come to use the cyber cafe for free and also the the public library. The refugees have a place to share with one another their joys and problems, communicate with family and friends through the internet. The daycare is free and takes care of children who are below school going age, this allowing their parents to go out to go to work and use their capacities and skills for an income without really having to worry about uh, child care, which is expensive and unaffordable to most. Household incomes are therefore increased and that improving living conditions. All the children come to play after school hours and various facilities are provided for different sports. Refugees come from all over the city of Addis Ababa, and uh, this has led to a request uh, that um, JRS considers establishing two, two more refugee community centers in different parts of the city. Um, the public library has been used for high school and university students as the cost of buying textbooks and other reading materials is quite high. This enables them to compete equally with their local peers. And the library is open to both the host and refugee population that pro that's promoting local integration and cohesion between the communities. Besides providing food and non food items to new arrivals, KRS provides information and accompanies each of these individuals to register with UNHCR and also refers those who need medical attention to hospitals that we have at home and feed. We also do follow up visits to their new home to ensure that the new arrivals are well settled in the city. This hospitality gives them a sense of self self worth and motivates them to remain resilient. Um, now there are some similarities between the two countries. We, in both countries uh, the services the the accompaniment model provides personalized support without using a one size fits all approach. Uh, we are guided by the JRS values of compassion, hospitality, and solidarity. And in both cases, beneficiaries are involved in decision making. Uh, the main differences are that uh, in Kenya, the services are decentralized. That is, we use different parishes. While in Addis Ababa, we only have one office where they all come, one center where they all come. And the day refugees are therefore in their homes in Kenya, while in Ethiopia, they have to come to the community center. However, this does request that we consider establishing two more centers. Uh, our main challenges have been that uh, this model is um, labor and time intensive. However, this is balanced by the fact that the refugee helpers and community leaders are empowered with the knowledge that they use to help their communities. This multiplies our outreach. Changes in government policy also sometimes limit our contact with refugees. For example, in Kenya this year, the government directed that all refugees must leave their urban areas and settle in the town. 
sometimes contact is lost in families as they as they said to keep that to keep moving from one area to another. Transport is also sometimes a challenge that not everybody is able to travel often. Uh, lessons learned are that accompaniment and vulnerable individuals such as new arrivals to set or in pasta, it also reduces suffering for those who would have the other forgotten. Accompaniment promotes refugee protection. It provides the individualized attention, gives credibility to our commitment. Accompaniment appreciates the uniqueness of each, each refugee and their experiences. They each have a different experience when each is able to cope differently. Um, other lessons learned are that provision of a safe place for refugees to, to, to meet and play, like in the refugee community center, restores their dignity. And the use of host community facilities such as parishes brings the refugees closer and provides a good basis for local integration. Sharing of the public library between the host community and the refugees enhances social cohesion, besides enabling them to compete equally with the host in academics. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. Now I'd like to turn the uh, program over to Junita Calder from JRS Asia Pacific. Junita, please, uh, uh, Beatrice, would you please pass the ball to Junita so she can begin? Junita, you should be able to. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. You got Okay. Junita, you have very much. More. Thanks very much, Missy and Beatrice. I see that there are a lot of people attending today. I, I don't blame you for taking time to find me in the list. So <laughs> I've been given 10 minutes <laughs> to cover a little bit the work that we do in Asia, the Pacific. Uh, I'm just trying to access the PowerPoint. Yeah, could could the host please bring up the PowerPoint for Asia Pacific for Junita? I think the visuals might help people to picture what I'm talking about. Uh, no, it's uh, on the screen. Uh, it should be. No, we don't. We don't have it. It is next to mine. Well, in any case, I can begin to describe a little bit our work. Uh, the first slide is actually just a map that will show you the countries that we work in. In Asia Pacific, JRS works across seven countries. In two of those, we actually work with internally displaced people in rural settings. So that's in Myanmar and in Mindanao in the Philippines. Uh, the majority of the rest of our work, however, has come to be based around urban refugees and detention centres as well. And what we find is that quite often our urban populations are based in cities, but families are split. Some of them are sometimes also in detention centres. So as we accompany people, we realise that we can become quite a useful link uh, for families who are separated. So I'll give a little bit of information about some of our <coughs> detention work tonight as well. Uh, Junita, could we could yes. we stop a minute? Um, uh, host in yes. Geneva, we still do not have the PowerPoint on view. Could you please check that for us? Yes. Checking. We have we have the first PowerPoint, but we do not have the second PowerPoint. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. I'm trying to share the file once again, because it seems it's shared. And I just take back the rule. There it is. I see it. Thank you. Thank you. So then uh, now, uh, if I give the role to you back, then you might be able to change uh, the. To 
the presenter. No. I am now the presenter. Thank you. I can see that. And I can change the slide. Thanks very much. So, as I was saying, we work in the seven different countries. Much of our work has come to be based around urban refugees uh, in all but two countries, in fact. However, even within those two countries, uh, sorry, even within those four countries where we work with urban refugees, we have two quite distinct contexts. Uh, one is in states that have signed the Refugee Convention. Uh, I call them convention states, and they include Australia and Cambodia. And the other is in uh, states who have not signed the 1951 Convention or its optional protocol. And those uh, countries that we work in are Thailand and Indonesia. So I'll talk a little bit about both contexts tonight and hopefully be able to share some good practices that can be uplifted for other non-convention countries uh, because I think now that we've done the work to develop the templates, if anyone needs them, we'd be happy to share. I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm very privileged to be speaking in a regional role, so I have the chance to overview many of these pieces of work uh, and suggest collaboration also with other partners, which is something that uh, Jarius really values. There's no way that we could reach as many people or that our accompaniment would be as useful if we couldn't make meaningful referrals to specialist service providers. I also wanted to mention that uh, we use home visits a lot in the Asia Pacific region when working with urban refugee populations. Uh, but I think Beatrice spoke a little bit about it and Zareen will give some more solid practices in a minute, so I won't focus too much, just to say that we have some real caseworker heroes who go every day around the big city that is Bangkok and uh, also in Indonesia to visit people in their homes. So <clears throat> in the convention countries, Australia and Cambodia, where we work, as I mentioned, some of our work is in detention, uh, others is in the community. I would like to share the words of one of our workers in Cambodia. Uh, Sony, who is a refugee herself, has worked for a long time in Phnom Penh helping people to adjust to life there. And when she speaks about her accompaniment approach, she says, first, I have to be friends with them. I sit down and listen to their story. Sometimes I cry with them. Sometimes I laugh with them. Sometimes I even share with them my own story, and we are happy together and sad together. I go to market with them and explain to them about the local food and how to bargain. I help them find a house, and I try to make something smooth with the landlord. And I go back again to see how they are getting on. I receive and listen to many phone calls every day. Sometimes I have to be a bit strong with them, offer them tough love to help them survived. And that quote that I just read to you is actually from a beautiful video that Jarius Cambodia has made about their accompaniment work. I provided the link in the PowerPoint uh, on the previous slide, so if anyone would like to watch and learn some more from that, they can. Similarly, I provided another video link for Jarius Australia's work, so I hope you'll take some time to check that out. I don't want to take too much time from all of you today, though, so I will move on to the non-convention countries. So in Thailand, JRS helps urban refugees with some emergency assistance. We do cash transfer programming for people who are really stuck, uh, homeless or at risk of exploitation and need help to survive in Bangkok. We also have a child protection project, which is an implementing partnership with UNHCR and have been doing some protection assessments these last four months that has helped a lot of children avoid street homelessness, which has been a great success. In addition, we do wraparound casework support and provide psychosocial activities, trainings and counselling. We also provide some encouragement to refugee CBOs, or organisations that are made up of refugees themselves, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end if I have a chance. 
here's an image of one of our caseworkers taking one of our child protection clients to UNHCR to register and start his RSD process. So in order to do all of our work, we've actually had to develop an interpreter training manual because without reliable community interpreters, there's no way that we could really connect with people and find out what their needs are. So the next few slides actually go through the interpreter training that was developed. You can see it's quite specific down to the time frame of the training day. And this is something that we'd be happy to share if anyone else needs uh, some fresh ideas of how to help community interpreters to develop professionally uh, and also to work on some of the challenges that we find are faced in doing real accompaniment with refugees, such as the changing position that people might have in the community. I'll move on now to Indonesia because I want to talk about another good practice that has been developed there, and that is uh, the support to people who are unsure of how to proceed with their refugee status determination. What we find is that many people are hungry for this information. Some of them have come to the country just in a hurry, they've fled, and they're not even really aware that they have a refugee claim. So our caseworkers find that they do all sorts of support, but one of the most common questions that comes out from having a close relationship with people is what do I do, how do I proceed with UNHCR? You'll see here some pictures of our staff who connect and accompany people in both the urban setting and detention and try to provide some of this information on how to put forward their RSD claim. The next slides show the chapter headings of a self-help kit that we are able to distribute to people who need help with starting their RSD statement. This is another practice we'd be happy to share and in fact, one of our partners in Indonesia, the Suaka Legal Aid Network, have developed even further. So I'd like to uh, give a shout out to them. And if you are in touch with either them or with us at JRS, we could help to share this practice. I note I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'll carry on. And I'll talk about our non-support to refugee CBO groups. One thing that JRS have discovered is that we can't do it all. And what's even more exciting when we accompany people is that we learn of their skills and their talents. I was just going to share quickly one story of a young man who came to us at JRS in Bangkok. And in his own words, he said he was homeless and starving. We gave him some emergency assistance and allowed him to sleep in one of our urban refugee community centres, which actually closed soon after. At the time we closed the centre, he asked us whether he could take the whiteboard and a few other supplies he could find there because he wanted to give back to his community by starting a school. We agreed. Several months later, we received an email where he recounted his story and attached the first monthly report of his newly established organization. You can see his first year celebratory Facebook status on this slide. And I share it partly so you'll know who he is, one of the real heroes doing accompaniment in his community, and partly just to say that as JRS, we realize that we are not the answer. Walking alongside people is the best we can do, and we really appreciate all those who we can refer to. Here is another example of a refugee community school that was set up in Indonesia with minimal JRE support. I'll leave you on that note and hand over to Zareen before I take up too much of her time. Thanks. Thanks for that marvelous presentation and now uh, if you would just pass the ball to Zareen, she will do our last presentation. Thank you. It's good that your name comes alphabetically last, Zareen, easy to find. 
Good morning, Serene. Please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Oh, yes. and, and, uh, and Geneva host, please, we need the last PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay. I've been having some issues with seeing the PowerPoint, so I might have to do mine blind if it doesn't come up. Um, hello? No, I don't have my, yeah, no, I don't have it. Just uh, share it once more again. Everyone, we'll just wait one more minute and see if we can get the PowerPoint uh, uh, on screen for you. There it is. Um, okay, I can. I can't see it. I can see the the subject bar, but I cannot see the presentation. So I might. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I've got it. Okay. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Beatrice and Janita and Nitsi. Um, I'm going to be doing the presentation from the point of view of a holistic approach that we adopt in the Middle East. And for the purpose of my presentation, I'll use the term refugee, but I'll be referring to both internally displaced people and refugees. It's just simply to say it's fine. Um, currently in the Middle East, Jared, we have projects in Syria, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, and uh, northern Iraq. We've been present in the region since 2008, and initially we had much smaller projects to start with, and in the last few years, due to the conflict in Syria, our projects have expanded quite significantly. Our main services that we offer is um, we do emergency support, so in the form of food support, we have vouchers, food baskets for cooked meals, non-food items, cash support for rain. We have educational and psychosocial services, and then very basic health care in the form of some clinics in some areas, uh, medical support for people with chronic illnesses or referrals. Our other presentations mentioned home visits, um, but I'm going to focus on them a lot more because they're really one of the defining features of our work here in the Middle East. Basically, home visits are the core of our work, and everything else flows from this. Through home visits, we're able to assess families' needs, to create a relationship with them over time that is mutually trusting. The by virtue home visits allow us to preserve people's dignity by not forcing them to have to queue for a long time outside our senses. And we also deal with them as a family, as a unit, and then often feedback that we get is that they feel that they're not seen as just another number when they work with Jerry. Our home visit teams are always gender balanced and they encourage as much as possible for their view of this diversity on the teams as well. And there's always a mix between refugee or displaced people in the home visit team and people from the host community. We have a fairly flexible approach because it's basically a mobile team so we can easily change or expand our areas of work if need be. And another important thing is that we any area we operate in, we make sure that we have very good relationships with community leaders or as strong relationships as we possibly can, whether they're religious or municipal. Good practices that have come out of the principle of accompaniment is that we use home visits as a way of basically talking to people and informing them of things that they need to know, the basic rights as if they're outside of their country, refugees. Services that are available to them generally encourage them to register with the UNHCR and all the different processes and how they can go about that. And also, it's where we're able to inform people of other organizations who might be better positioned to help them. We, it also provides us with an insight into people's living conditions and to household dynamics, which can be quite useful when it comes to protection concerns. And we are able to tell them how they can access local amenities, schools, and healthcare in the area. On every home visit team, we basically sort of have an outreach component. And so this is for people who live in difficult to reach areas and cannot move 
whether it's for security reason or immobility. And more often it's easier for us to go to them and than for them to try and make it to us. And during home visits, it's also an opportunity when we encourage families to leave their homes or wherever it is that they're staying and come to one of our centers, whether the purpose of that is so that they can register with us or to pick up a food basket or come to the center for some educational activities or something. And the point of that is that when they simultaneously come to the center for one service, they're also accessing or receiving information about others. And it's also a chance for them to engage with other people that are maybe in a very similar position to them and it helps them sort of create a sense of community and to step out of being isolated, which is one of the big problems of the refugee space. By spending time with people in their homes or private space, you're able to create a relationship of trust. And quite often when you're visiting one family, they'll tell you about someone else who's recently arrived or someone who maybe is in a worse situation than they are in the system. For our work here in the region, this word of mouth network has proven to be the most efficient in our experience. This is backed up, of course, with like having day to day to day contact, bulk messaging, one on one phone calls, and using social media. And it's happened fairly regularly that a family, for example, has left Syria and arrived in Jordan or Lebanon, and then they've sought out JRS in the host country based on a prior knowledge of us from somewhere else. We also prefer our approach is rather instead of only giving one service to thousands and thousands of families, we would rather serve a smaller number of families, but with at least three or four different services. So you can give one family, let's say, cash support for rent, plus their children are attending educational activities with us, and a food basket, is they'll receive their monthly food basket from us. So for us, this allows us to be almost guarantee or be much more certain of their well-being and to also monitor how they're coping. Um, so what does a home visit look like? Uh, it's basically exactly what it sounds like, <laughs> that you're just visiting someone you know, and you're having a cup of coffee with them and you're catching up on their latest news. This photo is in Erbid in Jordan and the two ladies sitting across directly opposite are two JRA staff members. And this is visiting people in an apartment block in Erbid and basically all of the residents in the apartment block are from Syria. Um, there's many challenges to our work. Um, I've chosen to highlight some of the main ones here. Whilst it's an asset to having uh, people from within the community who are affected by displacement being on your team, it also means that like, there's quite a high risk of fatigue because you have to be sensitive to the fact that we might be recreating trauma for some people who've already experienced something similar and now they're working in that again. So it's necessary to be vigilant, to make sure you debrief your team and make sure they're not visiting too many families in one day. Maintaining contact with families can be difficult because displacement happens multiple times yeah, in the Middle East, whether it's for reasons of conflict, eviction, can't afford to pay the rent. So that, um, that means it's difficult to keep track of them and follow up. We have something that I refer to as rural urban communities, which are people who are not in a city center, so they are sort of in the rural areas, but they're not in any formal camp, and so they're basically cut off from access to services, and it's quite difficult sometimes figuring out ways to reach them. And then a difficulty that we face is definitely the cost of transportation in the Middle East. It's very expensive, and it has a quite an impact on our program and on limiting how much we are able to do. More social tensions between your host and refugee or community are definitely a security risk for most of our team. Um, and it's just something that you're always assessing, you're always you know, evaluating your risk and whether it's okay for the family, for the home visits teams to go out that day or not. Um, we have yet as JRS in the Middle to develop a tool that is successful at measuring accompaniment. Um, alternatively, we could use other indicators that show or highlight the effects of accompaniment, but we haven't quite come up with a perfect 
way to measure it for monitoring and evaluation purposes. Uh, politicization of refugees is a problem. I think it's a problem everywhere, but it's a very volatile issue here, yeah, and it can definitely affect our ability to offer assistance to communities, for example, that we know definitely need our help, but we're unable to access them for one reason or the other. And then another thing is definitely making sure that we meet the needs of the most vulnerable refugee communities and not only the most popular by donor standards communities. Um, I took the liberty of giving you a glimpse of how our dairy center sort of functions. I hope you enjoy my little doodle. Um, basically, this is an illustration that sums up what I've just been saying. So, the home visit is a way of driving our programming, and the information we obtain from families while accompanying them helps us to understand what they need the most, and that helps us to adapt our response to them best. The services that I've listed here is coming from the GRA Center. Are, um, we, some centers offer all of those services, and some centers only offer some of them. It just depends on each local context. Um, I put in some images so that you can have an idea. This is a well, kindergarten class in Beirut, and it's in a community center that's based in a high density area. And it's, for example, this class is only Syrian children because they don't have access to education. Well, they don't have easy access to education in Lebanon, but in the afternoon, the center is used for activities that's for both the local host community and the refugee community. And then this is a photo of a displaced family in Erbil. And one of the things about being present through accompaniment and home visits is that you get to also share in people's joys and not only the tragedy and the trauma of their experiences and what they've been through. Um, to wrap up, I just thought it would be really nice to touch on shared values that we have as an organization and these values that are also significant within Middle Eastern society. Um, as a faith-based organization, we recognize the significant role that faith plays in helping people make sense of what's happened to them, as well as being the basis that their value systems are created from. Jerry's staff aren't required to be of any particular faith or belief but it is required that we allow or create the space for refugees to celebrate or honor their own faith. Often, faith is a way that people are able to cope with trauma, and to ignore or deny them that would be short-sighted in terms of helping them to ultimately recover. Hospitality is also key in the Middle East. Accompaniment easily fits into the concept of welcoming a stranger into your home. And that's what we allow refugees to do. We allow them to welcome us into their homes and to share their lives with us. That also alleviates the power dynamic that often exists of when they have to come to us in a place of assistance or something that they often find very humiliating. So going into their home as their guest shifts that power balance. Um, but of course it has to be something more than it's just a visit and a cup of coffee. You have to be able to use it as an opportunity to equip people with knowledge or the ability to become self-sufficient. We have to help people to build their resilience for the long term, so that they can do more than just survive the day. Um, this is basically what I have for now. There's much more I could say on this topic, but I don't want to run over time. So thank you very much for listening, and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Serene. Uh, perhaps you could pass the ball back up to me. No, oh, it bounced back to Beatrice. Hang Beatrice, on. could you pass the ball? To me? There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. We've reserved some time for questions and answers. If anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, if you would raise your hand, you see the hand symbol at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try to uh, I'll try to find you and call on you.
Uh, I'm going to move the ball down to, to Adeline. Adeline, do you have a comment? Adeline, would you like to make a comment? You please speak if you have something you'd like to say. Okay, I don't hear anything. Um, um, I, I uh, host. I'm wondering if I'm if I'm uh, is calling on people. Excuse me. Who's speaking? Uh, this this probably was Adeline because she's unmuted now. Okay, Adeline, would you like to make a comment? No. Okay. Uh, if someone called Melissa, who? Okay. Okay, now we mute back, Adeline. Okay, um, uh, host, do I do I do I simply name somebody and unmute them, or is there another process that I'm not doing properly? No, this is the process. Yes. You okay. Just name the person and unmute. All right. Yes. And and the people who have exclamation points next to their name are they the people who are asking to speak? No, I need a hand. Okay, I don't see I. I haven't I seen have, any. Melissa has a hand, but unfortunately, as I see, she has no speaking possibilities. I suggest Melissa to write a chat message, uh, then okay. uh, all chat message to all, and then we can see uh, what she wants. So she wrote privately, but uh, I shared what she wrote, that uh, she asked that if these part PowerPoints will be shared or not. The whole video, I think, and the PowerPoints will be shared, but I... I, I believe the whole video and the, uh, the whole presentation will be uh, recorded and will be available on the Urban Refugees website. That's urban good, the Urban Good Practices uh, website. So you can look for it there um, in the next few days. Okay, is, is there anyone else who would like to make a, uh, a comment? If so, please raise your hand using the hand symbol at the bottom of the screen. Oh, and Melissa has another question. What is the exact web address? So, of what? Of the Urban Good Practices website. I think if you type in, if you Google Urban Good Practices, you'll, you'll, it will come up immediately. I'm sorry I don't have the website uh, address in my head. Okay, I'm wondering if any of our presenters would like to make an, an additional comment uh, while we have this opportunity. Um, okay. This is a very quiet group of people. <laughs> <laughs> I I just like to make one comment then. Um, oh, that sorry to interrupt. I see that Ulysses, that Ulysses Grant has a uh, question. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear the name. Uly Ulysses. Ulysses. Um, okay. Uh, Ulysses, uh, please go ahead. Now you can speak. Yes. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Ulysses, we don't, we don't, we don't, yeah, 
Would you like to uh, text us a, a, a chat message? Yes, I, as I see, he has a question. Okay, I can't, I can't see it, Elif. Could you, could you read it for us? Is the interpretation manual available online? Uh, that is a question for Janita, I think. Hello there. Currently, the interpreter training manual is not available online, but we are happy to share it through the Urban Good Practices website. Uh, I'll arrange to do that with UNHCR this week. Thank you. I see Kristen Lange has a question. Let me uh, give the floor to her. Kristen, go ahead. Christian, uh, Christian uh, Lange, yes. Oh, Kirsten. Kristen, we can't hear you. Are, do you have a question? Oh, uh, okay. She typed it. All right. Now. Uh, It says that, did you face any challenges mm. or any example of good practices in engaging refugees, IDPs with disabilities? So, so assisting refugees and um, IDPs with disabilities. Uh, I know we have special programs for that in several locations. Would, would any of you ladies like to uh, make a comment on that? Junita? I can answer. Yes, I see Zareen, you typed it, you yeah. can answer. <laughs> um, Go ahead, and I'll add something like that. Okay, so. so okay, um, yeah, in, uh, for example, in Jordan, when we've done family visits and we've encountered people, there's a significant amount of refugees with disabilities from Syria. Um, first sort of point of call would be the main people there we would refer to Handicap International, although at some point there was, you know, Handicap couldn't handle the volume of people, and then we got in touch with another organization that was also helping people with disabilities. And so, and we would follow up until we're certain that the people, because our family does it mean that we don't only go once, we go several times in the same family. So you're able to ensure that they are seen to by the other organization and that they do receive the prosthetic or a wheelchair or crutches. And inside Syria, in some we have a center for people with disabilities and we ensure, you know, we, that they're able to come to the center and that they go home and we're able to, yeah, we're able to handle that even in the current situation. Um, but it's basically for us with disabilities, it's very much a strong system of referrals because that's not our area of expertise. But yeah, so far we've had good practice with it. Okay, Junaida? Yes, so I can just add that in the accompaniment video that was shared from Jarius Cambodia, there's a lovely section actually on the long-term outreach that Jarius Cambodia has been doing to survivors of landmines and other unexploded ordnance, which has been a real issue since the refugee returned there many years ago. So you'll see in the video clip uh, that we actually have some uh, disabled friends and staff members of Jarius Cambodia who go and do that outreach. Uh, they make sure that when they identify people through home visits and through community referrals, uh, that those people can have access to prosthetics or wheelchairs, uh, which uh, used to be built by Jarius, but now that project's been taken over by another. So we do that through referral. And the second half of that, that would be the accompany and serve part of Jarius' work. But the other part is that for many years, Jarius has also done advocacy around the issue of survivors. And that work has been very successful to the point that now both the Cambodian government and the Thai government have taken some budget responsibility for assisting those survivors. And a large way that that's gone ahead is through survivor networks where again, uh, the survivors are encouraged to get together, identify each other, and put forward their voice in a coordinated way. So
So you can see a little bit of that in the video and there's plenty more information about it on the JRS Cambodia website. They've put together some excellent research in the last year. Uh, one publication called I'm Happy I'm Alive, uh, which talks about the successes that survivors have had and the ways that they've diversified their, uh, their skills and their community to achieve effective livelihoods. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to add, I think one of the uh, really real strengths of the accompaniment model is that when we do home visits and when we get to know people as friends, we're able to give support to caregivers who are um, trying to serve the uh, disabled people in their families. And sometimes that is really uh, very important to their being able to continue to give uh, quality care. We're also able to educate families about opportunities that might be available for disabled family members. And uh, one example I think where, where, uh, this, where accompaniment has affected our programming was in Nepal. Now this was a camp-based program, but in Nepal where in our home visits in the camps, we noticed a pattern of uh, deafness. There were many deaf people for some reason in the camp. And our home workers having noticed this problem and the isolation of deaf uh, ad adults and children, started a sign language program so that every deaf person uh, in the camps uh, was it, learned sign language and was able to communicate then with their, uh, their, their fellow deaf people and also their families when they learned to sign as well. That was something that came directly out of the observations made during home visits uh, and of, a, of a pattern of need. Now I'm looking to see if we have other other questions. Is there anyone else who'd like to send us a chat or would like to ask a question? I see a Celine Krebs. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm looking just one second. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have a, a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we do. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, so it was very interesting. And uh, I have a question on uh, focusing on housing uh, because um, I, I did, you didn't mention something, uh, some pr uh, specific projects linked to housing, but I was wondering whether you had uh, some uh, a project uh, focusing on housing and with a livelihoods program uh, in one of the three areas, maybe. Um, we don't we don't do livelihoods in the Middle East. Okay. And housing is um, we rather because the we don't do housing in the sense like we do not we don't find housing for people, but we're, we have cash support for rent. So, okay. and we often like will negotiate with the landlord to try and make sure that people are like not unfairly evicted from their houses. Um, but it's not, and we will assist with, or we will refer if, the, if their living conditions are in a very poor state, then we can refer to, like in Jordan, we refer to Islamic Relief to help with rehabilitating people's homes if they're in a very bad condition. Um, but per se, providing housing, we don't do that in the Middle East, it's not our area. Okay, thank you. In Asia Pacific, we uh, follow a casework model, so uh, home visit is the first step or um, when clients come in also to the JRS Center and our caseworkers follow up with all of their needs. Housing is one, often, uh, and we do the same like Zareen said, negotiation with landlords, uh, sometimes we are able to suggest sort of lower rent neighborhoods uh, and also give some ideas about uh, good practices, Thai cultural orientation, for example, um, you know, the hours that people wake and sleep usually uh, so that the refugees don't come under unnecessary scrutiny because here in Bangkok they're uh, liable to be arrested if their neighbors are not happy with their behavior and report to the police. So we give some of that um, counselling general advice and uh, help them to, just through our own 
referral networks uh, to find adequate housing. Okay. In Kenya, we, we provide rent for, for about four months. Uh, but you find that sometimes there will be families that will need, will need the support for longer than that. And we also do, we have a program on livelihood where we we provide small grants and they are able to start small businesses and uh, in other cases we give them vocational training and that um, that is basically what Kenya has been doing. Okay, Nicholas has his hand up. Uh, we're turning the floor over to you. Do you have a question? Oh, I see he's typed a question. Uh, what kind of incentive do you provide to the team members conducting home visits, and what is the process for selecting them? Someone like to start? Yes, in Kenya we we have the what we call them helpers. And they are mainly uh, appointed or selected by their community. So they are recommended to us by the community. And what happens is that we have an, an allowance for them. They are not officially staff, and that's why they work for only two days a week. So we have a, an allowance for them. Hello. Um, yeah, in the Middle East, it's. Uh, there's a, it depends on which area. It's different from city to city, but they they all receive compensation and uh, or the salary. It depends. And then um, the process of selection is you go through an interview process, and there's also training provided on basic counseling. And there's a social worker that accompanies them in the beginning until they're certain of how to conduct the family visit appropriately. And yeah, they go through an interview process with project directors and social workers, if possible, social workers present as well. So in Asia Pacific, we uh, it's a little bit similar. We, most of our um, home visitors are professional staff, but they take with them refugee community interpreters, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, so the staff are on salary retainers and the refugee community interpreters are uh, provided hourly stipends on an on-call basis. basis. Um, they're not employees, they're volunteers because uh, there's no chance for them to work in these countries. Uh, also, the process for selecting them is uh, self-nomination first or a little bit like Beatrice mentioned, quite often community members will come to us and say, have you thought about training this person as one of your interpreters because we trust them and we like to bring them with us when we visit you or when you come to our house, we will have them there. So it's a little bit of a combination between people volunteering themselves and our, our communities recommending them all of them go through the training before the interpreter training before they go out with the professional team. Okay, we've we've reached the end of our hour. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to uh, to add? Any more questions or any observations from the panelists? Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. And I'd just like to leave you with the thought that although the accompaniment mat model is, as you've seen, labor intensive, we think that it brings uh, uh, rich rewards for both uh, the people who, who uh, uh, provide accompaniment and also, of course, for the refugees we seek to serve. And it is often the very first step in recovery, as people recover their trust, they recover their confidence, and they recover uh, and, and they learn new means and new opportunities to move forward with their lives. So thank you again, uh, everybody, and uh, we'll close this session. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.